Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to be starting in a minute, so get yourself settled and ready, and uh, we'll get going soon. Don't worry, we'll be here with you in a moment. Hello again, everyone. We've still got some more participants coming in, so we're just going to wait another minute to get everyone in so they're all ready for the start. So if you could just bear with us a second, we won't be long. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming and welcome to this session of the BTO virtual conference this year. We're sorry that once again this year, the pandemic means we're unable to meet you in person, but it's exciting to see that over 130 people have connected and no doubt more are watching on our Facebook and YouTube live streams. More than we could have hoped would actually have fitted into the conference center at Swanwick where we normally meet. Whether you're a, welcome, a regular conference attendee or this is your first time, welcome to you all. My name's Catherine Balgen. I'm a BTO research ecologist as part of the BTO's um, Cymru team, but also the wetland and marine teams. And I'm gonna be chair for you this afternoon. We have three fantastic talks all lined up and there will be time for questions at the end of each of these. So feel free to, any questions that you have coming up, put them into our Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You should hopefully be able to see that. If you spot any good questions as well that others have asked while you're in there, please give them a thumbs up as a little symbol and it gives them a greater prominence so they'll have more chance of being asked live. If you have any more questions of a general nature about the BTO, please save these for the AGM session on Saturday and we'll get through them then. So we have 11 free talks lined up for you this week as well as our AGM and these are only possible thanks to the support of BTO members. So a huge thanks to all of you who are here today. Income from memberships and donations make up almost half of our charity's total income. And without your support, the BTO wouldn't be what it is today. Thank you very much. If you're in a position to make an extra donation to support our work, we would be extraordinarily grateful. And you can do so at the special link bto.org forward slash support that you should see on the screen now. Also, if you aren't already a member and you enjoy today's talk and feel like the BTO is an organisation you'd like to support, please do consider joining us. Our members are really our lifeblood. It's through membership support that we can inspire and educate people and advance our collective understanding of birds through research. Having said all that, let's jump straight in with our first talk, which will be presented by Neil Burton. He's going to be telling you about his fantastic research into individual acoust into acoustic monitoring as a tool to monitor uh, survival, and it's using a pilot study of tree pickers. So we'll take him away in a second. Hello. Okay, so yes, as Catherine said, I'm going to be talking about a novel technique, individual acoustic monitoring 
and how this might be used as a tool to monitor avian survival. So to understand the causes of population change, it's important to understand the underlying demographic rates, so breeding success and survival, and how those might change in relation to different drivers and, and vary over time and according to geography. So for bird species in the UK, annual survival is monitored through the BTO's Retrapping Adults for Survival Scheme, or RAS scheme, in which birds are marked with metal or colouring or, or color rings, as in this bird here, and then subsequently either recaptured or recited in the field. And then that information is used to estimate survival. However, it's important to consider biases, for example, in the catchability of individuals or their subsequent re-encounter. So my study species is the tree pipit. It's one of our Afro-Paleoctic migrants. Um, it's currently on the red list of birds of conservation concern in the UK. And that list was just updated this week. And as you can see from the graph at the bottom, um, showing the BBS trend for, for England, um, there's been quite a decline for this species over the last 25 years. So I've been studying the species um, through a RAS project in Thetford Forest in East Anglia for the last 10 years or so. I've been catching birds and colour ringing them, um, primarily, primarily catching them in mess nets and through playback. Um, but I've been wondering, as I've been doing that, um, whether I might have biases in my data set. Do I catch younger birds more often, for instance, or does catching affect the subsequent sightings I might get? And of course, catching itself um, does take effort for species like tree pipit. Um, you quite often have to target birds on individual territories, um, so it can take time to build up a decent sample size. And of course, you don't always catch every bird that you want to, so you don't necessarily sample the whole population. On top of that, it can be difficult to recitings. Um, so that depends on habitat and species, of course. Um, for species like tree pipit, they're quite often singing at the tops of trees, and it can be difficult to actually find them, let alone see, see legs and um, be able to read colour rings. So the main question of this study has been to evaluate the recording of song as an alternative approach to monitor survival in the tree pipit. And this has been a collaboration with researchers um, by acoustic experts in the um, Charles University in Prague, um, who've also been undertaking work on the species there. And we've had two main questions. Firstly, does catching and handling affect subsequent re-encounter rates or apparent survival? And secondly, are the survival rates assessed through colouring comparable to those of unhandled birds? Okay, so first of all, what is individual acoustic monitoring? Well, it's quite simply the monitoring of individuals through recording of their song and then analyses of those songs and understanding the different repertoires of individuals. Um, it's got potential benefits, as, as said, um, it's non-invasive, you don't have to catch the bird, you don't have to handle it, you're just recording the bird in the field. And there is also the potential to monitor all individuals, or at least for most species, males in the population. Um, but there are limitations. So for most species, um, of course, it's only the males that sing, so you're only monitoring the males. And individuals also must show differences in their song repertoires. And those repertoires as well must be stable over time. So um, tree pipits usually deliver their song um, from perches or in flight. Um, so quite often they fly up from those perches and then they're parachuting back down from the perches, singing all the way. Um, for example, with this bird here. Just got um, a couple of sonograms to begin with, um, just to show you what those look like. Um, so these are two birds recorded in Thetford Forest in 2016 and 2017, um, showing different phrases of the song. Um, hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Um, so that's a typical song delivered in flight, showing different phrases along, along um, the length of that song. Um, in the second case, again, it's a song delivered in flight, um, but showing a number of um, 
more phrases within that song. So in, in this case, the bird's um, showing a number of different trills in there. There's um, a loud trill between about seven and nine seconds into that song, but there's a softer trill as well at around three seconds. So there's different phrases within that song and more different phrases than in the first one. How do we analyze the, the song? Well, really we're looking at the individual syllables um, so you can start breaking up the different phrases in the song and start looking at the different um, syllables within it. And then it's, it's a case of looking at the different syllable forms and their frequency in the song. So how many different um, types of syllables there might be. And here again, we've got a song delivered in flight um, and showing some of the different symbols in those different phrases. And it's analysing those to come up with the full repertoire for the individual that um, is used in analysis. So how long does that take? Well, typically, and this is work again from the Czech study, um, you need about 20 songs as a minimum to assess an individual's full repertoire to, to understand all the different syllables that it might be using. Um, but that could be up to about 30 um, individual songs that you need to record. Um, it does vary by individuals just depending on, on what you're recording at the time. So that might be between sort of maybe five and eight minutes worth of recording. So I've got um, two different um, sonograms shown here. Um, these birds recorded in Thetford Forest. And it's birds, um, and those songs at first glance look really quite similar. So do, do individuals vary in their repertoires? Well, if we start looking in more detail and start looking at individual syllables, you can start spotting some differences. Um, so here in the top case, um, that first, that syllable has got um, three elements at the start of it. And then in the, in the bottom case, there's only two elements. So you can start picking out differences. Then if you look at another syllable, again, there's, there's differences in the number of elements that that syllable contains. So birds, individuals will share syllables and there will be individual syllables that do match up across individuals. But then when you start looking across the repertoires as a whole, that's when you actually start seeing individuals and, and individual repertoires do seem to be unique. What about stability across years? Well, again, um, this is data from the Czech study or, or, or information from the Czech study in the first instance, um, looking at colouring birds and, and how their songs might vary through time. Um, so this bird actually is one ringed in Thetford Forest, um, 2016 and 2017. And you can see that the songs in the two years contain pretty much identical syllables. So there's stability in the repertoires across years, which means you can monitor them through time. But the first main question for the study was, does catching affect recitings? So this was looked at through data collected in the Czech fields, field study site. And this is one of their researchers actually in the field recording a bird in song, which is the tiny bird, a tiny dot up in the sky there. Um, so in this case, individual acoustic monitoring was used to monitor two groups of adult tree pipits um, weekly through the course of the breeding season over a period of nine years. And in this case, um, two groups were compared, um, a handled group that had been caught and um, in mist nets and then colour ringed, and then an unhandled group which was only monitored through individual acoustic monitoring. Um, the analyses use standard mark recapture analyses to compare, in the first instance, re-encounter rates. Um, so that's the probability of um, seeing a bird that is known to be alive, and then the survival rates and how those compare between groups. So um, looking in the first instance at re-encounter rates, um, so this shows the re-encounter rates for both um, groups of birds over the course of the breeding season from April through to June and, and um, start of July. 
And you can see, first of all, that the V encounter rates um, through individual acoustic monitoring decline through the course of the breeding season. And that's to be expected because birds tend to sing most when they first arrive at the start of the breeding season in April and early May. And then through the course of the breeding season, of course, birds get paired up, they start nesting and go, go a bit more quiet. Um, so that decline there really just reflects the song activity of the species. Um, but you can also see that there's differences between the two groups, between the unhandled and the handled birds. And in this case, the handled birds were actually um, recorded more frequently than the unhandled birds. If you look at survival rates, um, and this, is, this graph shows annual survival rates, um, but I've also analysed data just looking at the survival through the breeding season. Um, there's no difference in the survival rates um, between the two, hand, two groups, the handled birds and the unhandled birds. And the overall survival rate based on the individual acoustic monitoring um, is around 43% for this study site. Um, so hence it looks like um, from, on the basis of the survival rates and on the basis of the re-encounter rates that there aren't any negative effects of catching and handling on whether birds are seen again. So the second question, um, how does survival estimates um, compare between methods? Um, this has been the question I've been looking at in my own study site here in Thet um, Thetford Forest. Um, so this just shows one of the study plots um, that I've been working on. And it's a you know, particularly good area of this with very high densities of birds, um, quite a lot of song perches that they use and very suitable habitat. Um, so again, um, I've been looking at this with um, independent samples of birds. Um, so independent samples of tree pipits monitored, in this case, each half month through the breeding season. Um, firstly, using colour ringing um, from 2010, and then using individual acoustic monitoring um, from 2016. And I've essentially divided up the different areas um, that I that I have study plots on in the forest um, to be monitoring using one technique or the other. Then again, using standard mark recapture analyses, I've been aiming to compare the re-encounter rates between methods and then the um, survival rates between methods. I should note I've, I've referred to these as apparent annual survival rates um, rather than true survival rates um, because of course birds can move out of an area, emigrate from an area and, and not be seen again. So how do these rates compare? I um, should note um, that I've not analysed data from 2020 and 2021 yet. Um, there were impacts on the field effort, of course, because of the um, lockdowns during the pandemic. Um, so I, I need to, to assess those data um, still. But the initial results that I've got um, have been quite favourable. Um, so if you compare the survival rates that I've been getting from the colour ringing in the long term and then in, in the short term from individual acoustic monitoring, um, these compare quite favourably. And if you look at the pattern over the three years that both have been monitored, um, those are showing similar um, trends, variability between years between the two methods. Um, so that's very reassuring that the methods are producing similar results. So overall, um, I think we can say that individual acoustic monitoring is proving an effective means to be able to monitor tree pipits and um, their survival. So individual tree pipits can be reliably identified by their song repertoires, and those repertoires are stable between years, enabling long-term monitoring. Catching and handling doesn't seem to negatively affect either their behaviour or survival. But there are differences in the re-encounter rates of handled and unhandled birds. Um, handled birds did seem to have higher re-encounter rates, and that might suggest that colour ringing might be biased towards territorial in individuals, so the ones that stay put um, through the breeding season, or at least those that might remain vocal through the season. So that might actually be unpaired birds rather than paired birds, but ones that stay put. Um, how do the survival estimates compare? 
well, those preliminary analyses suggested no significant differences in the apparent survival rates through colour ringing and individual acoustic monitoring. And furthermore, the survival estimates produced from the studies um, from both techniques do actually match um, previous estimates reasonably well, which is, which is also reassuring. Um, so in conclusion, um, both colour ringing and individual acoustic monitoring do seem to be of value for long-term monitoring um, for survival, um, but it is important to understand those biases, whether you might be monitoring di different individuals. And that, that could work both ways, both with colour ringing and individual acoustic monitoring, which could be um, recording birds that don't actually stay put and move around a bit more. But individual acoustic monitoring is likely to be more representative of all birds, at least males, in a study population that use, use the study site. So what about the wider applicability? Um, well, individual acoustic monitoring at the moment, um, as I say, is limited to males. It's also limited to species with stable and individually unique vocalizations. Um, it has got some limitations, um, but the data collection is usually quite quick. Um, but on the other hand, um, the analyses of songs at the moment is quite a lengthy process. Um, so I've only recently um, got the full results um, for this season um, for, for data recorded back, um, back in the spring. Um, however, um, there is the potential for automated identification of individuals from recordings in the future. Um, that is something that a number of study groups are looking at. Um, so that's a development that um, could prove interesting and that could um, mean that the technique can be rolled out more widely. Of course, the other aspect to mention, of course, is that you do need equipment to be able to record birds. Um, so that comes with some expense as well. I just wanted to add a couple of last slides um, just to show some of the additional research questions that the technique alongside colour ringing um, is being used to explore. Um, so this map shows the Czech study site um, with data from 2013 um, and looking at the territory dynamics and how that might relate, relate to pairing status or mating system. Um, so in this case, most of the territories were stable through the breeding season. Um, so that's the um, territory shown by the white um, symbols. Um, but about a third of the territories or a third of the birds were moving between territories over the course of the season. And that could be, for example, unpaired birds um, moving to different territories to try and find a female. Um, but we've also seen from data um, here in the UK, and this is actually a colouring bird rather than one that was sound recorded, um, that birds actually might move between territories for different reasons. Um, so this bird was recorded over three years. Um, in the first year, it was moving between two different areas, um, singing and then had a nest on one of those areas. Um, but in the second and third year, it um, used two different study plots within the area. And on both of those study plots, um, it had nests and with different females and those nesting attempts actually overlapped. So in this case, the bird um, um, had two females and, and shown polygamy. So there's a number of reasons why birds might move between territories. And, that, and that's an additional question that we're trying to understand further with the technique. So I'll leave it there. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to all those in Prague, um, particularly Teresa, Hannah and Adam, um, others at the BTO that have helped in the study over the course of the last few years, um, all those at Forestry England that have helped with permissions and also for funding um, from Mark Constantine. So thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. That's really interesting. It's great to be able to see that all presented. Uh, we've had a number of questions for you, so if you're ready, we'll go ahead with some of those. Um, one of the first questions was, to what degree can acoustic monitoring be used to monitor more common species, as in addition to the BTO's BBS? Um, yeah, so in, in this case, um, we're really looking at um, survival or trying to understand the movements rather than necessarily numbers. Um, so acoustic monitoring 
um, is being used more broadly to understand which species use areas. Um, so that's something that is being developed. One of the difficulties is, is understanding the numbers of birds you're recording. Um, so so that's, that's a constraint potentially, um, but it does of course show presence absence. Um, in this case, um, as, as the recording is very much more targeted to the individuals, you're looking at the individual movements. Cool. And that kind of leads into one of the second questions, asking whether tree pipit's a particularly good candidate for individual songs, like how many other species would be appropriate for working in this method? Um, yes, I mean, it does depend on song. Um, interestingly, the Czech group um, it's, it's looked at a number of species, including different pipit species. Um, some other groups have looked at larks. Um, Yellowhammer has actually been one that there's been a lot of research on. Um, but there can be variation even in species like um, chiff chaff, for instance. So um, the potential is there, but there, there will be some species with more simple songs where, where it will obviously be a constraint. Thank you. Um, we've got a question now from Facebook live stream. Um, very interesting, says Kay, but how will the IAM data be used or indeed can it even be used to find out why there's decline in tree pivots? Um, so at the moment I'm focused on the survival rates, um, so I'm hoping to do some analysis that brings all that together um, with the colour ringing to um, get uh, some results out, a paper out, um, investigating those survival rates and then it's it's been um, considering those survival rates in relation to the population decline and to see whether actually changes in survival might be a cause of the population decline is, is the key question. Cool thank you. So a slightly longer one here from Hillary on our Zoom. So she says this is really interesting as I've been training young upcoming ornithologists and bird guides in Rwanda in acoustic recording of birds. On using playback, I steered them away from all but very limited use as it may disturb breeding birds or actually change their acoustic response from their regular songs or calls. What do you think about using playback in this context, she asks. Yeah, so I'm only using playback um, to catch birds and it's actually um, quite a limited time. Um, so really trying to keep that short to, to catch individuals but not use thereafter. Um, it can affect things and actually um, we found through, through some of the study that um, having caught a bird through playback, it, it might actually then avoid um, that area or, or, or the mist net again. Um, so it ha can have subsequent um, effects on, on, on the catchability of individuals, um, which you know obviously is a concern if you're trying to um, monitor things through be catching birds. Thank you. So the next two questions, one from Zoom and one from YouTube, are kind of linked together. So Graham on Zoom asks what's the ballpark cost of kit needed, whilst Paul from YouTube says um, if it's expensive equipment, wouldn't the voice recorder on a mobile phone be good enough if a bird was reasonably near an environment not too noisy or windy? So kind of a cost and whether a mobile phone would work. Yeah, so at the moment, um, so I'm using equipment that was recommended by the researchers in Prague, so sort of fairly good equipment. So it's um, including the microphone, the recorder, everything. Um, it was about £1,000, um, and that was part of the funding that we generously got given for the study. Um, I should say, actually, when I started this, I was using a back recorder, um, borrowed from someone else at the BTO, and, and just with a small handheld microphone, and that, and that worked really effectively, actually. Um, so it, it is possible to sort of use other other kits that might not actually be sort of specifically set up um, towards this. Um, it, it really depends on sort of how clear and how close a signal you can get. Um, so it's, it's not impossible by mobile phone, but you're less likely to get good quality recordings of all the individuals. Um, so usually having a, a handheld microphone that you can direct at the bird is the critical thing. Thank you very much. Um, we have just about reached our limit on time for questions. If there's any more questions, I'm sure we'll be able to answer them via our social media channels if anyone wants to repeat them again. But otherwise, thank you very much, Neil, for your talk and thank you everyone for your questions. We're now going to move on to our next speaker, who is Greg Conway. Um, he's going to be talking to us about night jars and how they can reveal their selective diet and foraging behaviour. He's working locally, so it will be really good to hear that. So on to Greg. Good 
Good afternoon. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about night jars and their diet. And this is a bit of preliminary work really. So it's in early stages, but it's still very insightful into sort of what we know about night jars and what they eat and why they go to certain places to eat what they do. Greg, you just need to launch your screen share there. Great. Do you want me to drive it from here? If you like, Nick. Yeah, I'm just having trouble finding the share button. It should be live there now, so you can just do the uh, commentary, Greg. Okay, so sorry about that technical pitch. So today I'm going to talk about night jars and their diet. Um, and this is a big bit of work, really. It's collaborative. So just the bottom slide here, we can see it's uh, based on a paper that we've recently published. And that's with colleagues in Belgium who've got a similar study site to ours and also researchers at Cambridge University. So it's quite a big undertaking and needs a big team to do it. And this tea, um, actual paper can be downloaded for free, actually, if you haven't seen that already. So the link is there and I can forward that on to anyone who's interested later on so you can read it in a bit more detail. So really coming to the talk structure, so we'll initially look at nightjar biology and population trends. And then we'll look at other diet studies and what the limitations have been with those. And then why are we concerned about insect decline? We've heard a lot about that um, for other species, but night jars being insectivore has also raised quite some major concerns. Well, a brief overview then of the main study aims, and then come on to the methods which combine GPS tracking, moth trapping, and the DNA diet analysis. So combining the package into one um, strand is very powerful and very informative. And then we'll have a quick overview of the results and then the main conclusions. So going straight in then just a little bit about night jars. So we've got a shot here of Thetford Forest, one of our main study sites. And you can see the forest environment is made up of a mosaic of mature trees and then these are paler patches which are felled areas which then regrow with the night jars nest. So for those they need bare ground on which to put their nests and also obviously there are a nocturnal species, many crepuscular active at dawn and dusk, but effectively um, active through the night. So they need the bare ground in which to place their nest. So they typically have two eggs and they'll have one to two breeding attempts per year. And then the chicks grow up and then they're fed on their sort of classic food, which is moth. So nightjar is very much a moth specialist, one of the sort of few British species which um, uses these items. So that sort of yeah, leads on to their dependence on that food type. So coming back to the main nightjar population trends. So the species is more situation in the south of Britain. So from the bird atlas map here, we can see the pink areas of their established territory holding areas. The red arrow uh, triangles indicate where they've increased, but the grey triangles increase where they've decreased. So they're very much um, confined to Britain and southern Britain now. Looking at the population trends based on Atlas work and also our annual or national night jar surveys from 1981 onwards, we can see that all the population dips after the 1970s, it has made a very strong recovery and numbers are now back to prior levels, if not slightly higher. So that all looks quite positive for an you know, insectivore, which um, um, is doing pretty well for itself. But what we have found is that within certain sites that the population is going down. So here in Thetford Forest over the last um, 10 to 15 years, we've found that there's been a 30% decrease in the number of birds nesting in the forest. We know this is partly due to the availability of felled habitat, which um, obviously they were relying for nesting, 
But we know there are other areas in the forest which are open, but they're not actually used by nightjars for nesting. So they're not limited by habitat. So that then sort of um, raises the concern that the other factors responsible for that decline and then food availability and breeding productivity are the other two. And that's one of the main areas you want to investigate in this um, talk today. So coming back to previous diet studies, so the I mean, night jar has been studied pretty well. We'll see here that there's been studies right back to the 1920s, more recently in uh, sort of, um, 2012. But these have really relied on dissection of fecal pellets, a bit like what you do with barn owl pellets, really, to find out all the bones and things of the prey. But for night jar, as they eat mostly moths, um, a lot of the items that come out um, really result in sort of moth scale coming through and very few sort of parts which you can actually use to identify the moth which they're eating. However, things like beetles, which are very chitinous and can survive the digestion process, they come through intact or in large pieces, which we can use to identify certainly the beetles down to family and species level. But everything else just goes through and we don't really have an idea of, you know, what moth species they're favouring or what other insects they might be eating as well. So the most of these historic studies have shown that moths appear in about over 95% of the pellets, so that confirms our understanding of observations that they eat mostly moths. But beetles are also quite a substantial component, um, between 5 and 40% of some pellets will contain moth um, beetles. And other flies, that are two-winged dipteran flies, these can make up to about 10% of some pellets, um, but again, these items are very small and very hard to detect. But with new DNA sequencing methods, we can then actually sort of process the pellets to really reveal all the prey items which the individuals cons um, consumed. So that's going to be the sort of main basis of the study. So the concern for invertebrate declines, it's really a, a global problem. So we've got a, a selection of papers here which highlight the problems that's around the world. Um, pretty much all habitats were affected where they had invertebrate populations and these declines have Cut across the board, North America, quite um, sharp patterns here from certainly on the east side. Um, and then more worryingly, this other paper from Germany, which investigated um, invertebrate populations on a number of their uh, sort of protected sites. So these are really high conservation value sites, which have got adequate management. And even here on these top sites, there are quite substantial insect declines. So if it's happening on their protected sites, then on the less protected sites, the declines are likely to be even greater. So we're quite fortunate in Britain that um, through butterfly conservation and their annual moth monitoring, so we've got um, some really good data going back to about 50 years now. And what this has shown is a very steady and ongoing decline in the large, large moth population. So there's been regular monitoring at over 500 sites and these are with standardized moth traps um, every year. And these have indicated a 33% drop in moths over the last 50 years. And that decline has been slightly greater in the south of Britain. So that ties in with the sort of nightjar's main breeding area. So where nightjars are most numerous, the declines in moths have also been the most severe. So that does raise potential concerns for the species in the future. So the aims and objectives, so we really want to determine the full range of prey uh, taken by night jars, and that's where the DNA techniques come in. And also try to understand which are the most important prey species, you know, whether certain moths are favoured, and whether those moths are actually declining uh, more so than other moth species. So it's depending how vulnerable they might be. And also to investigate why in night jars, the foraging sites are located quite a distance away from the nest sites. Um, so in order to do that, we want to look at the prey communities. So we'd assume that the prey uh, community around the nest site is quite different to that away compared to the foraging site. So that's one aspect we can look at in quite a bit of detail. And then also to sort of look at the, um, where the local population declines have occurred across southern England and to see whether this might be linked to food availability, which is one of the concerns we have here in Thetford Forest. So just looking at the study, so this is based on two study sites, one here in the UK in Thetford Forest and another in a comparable heathland site in Belgium. So again, they're quite wooded areas and we've used both sites because they've got intensive um, population monitoring, monitoring nests and also GPS tracking. 
and the habitats are quite comparable. Okay, there will be differences between the UK and the continental moth communities, but essentially we can look at the abundance of moths. We know what the birds are doing, where they're hunting, and we can make some good um, inferences between the two. And just to indicate the types of habitats, so night jars will use sort of open heathery heathy habitat, as well as recently cleared forest habitats. And then the habitat which is really prime is when the trees are starting to regrow with bits of birch mixed in. And these habitats are quite similar between the two sides. So one of the main methods we use for studying night jar to understand where they're foraging is using GPS tracking. So the bird here has a GPS tracker on its tail, which is a temporary mounting. And these are deployed for up to about a week. And each night these will record locations every three to five minutes. As we'll see in a minute, this gives us a really detailed picture of where the birds move to um, sort of collect their food in the evening and how they sort of use the area around their nest sites and territories. And pretty much all these birds have been caught at nest sites. We know exactly where their nest is and we know where they've moved to um, in relation to their nests. And this is really revealed that most of the time is spent actually around the nest area. But at dawn and dusk, the birds do make a very rapid uh, flight to their main foraging areas where they feed for maybe five minutes or 15 minutes and they seem to be able to collect a large amount of food there and then come back to the nesting area to spend the nest and the night around there. So that's really quite useful to know what they do and where they go. This is quite complex, but this is um, a composite here to show the dots which indicate where the nest sites are, the coloured dots and the corresponding colour with the um, area outline. So the yellow dot relates to these yellow um, outlines, which indicate the foraging areas. And we can see pretty much in all the cases that these birds which nest in the forest come out off the edge of the forest into quite open grassy heathland and farmland to do most of their feeding and foraging. And as you can see, some of these birds, are not the blue dot, is moving over four kilometers each night, commuting backwards and forwards to its foraging area and back to its nest site. And also on this, we've indicated where our moth traps are, we'll come on to that in a minute, but we've got quite a good standardized design. So we put moth traps in the same locations, the same sort of clear fell areas as where the night jars are nesting, and also onto the heathland sites as well. So we want to sort of capture the moth communities immediately around the nest site where they spend most of their time but also on these foraging areas to understand whether the moth communities there might be different. And the grey lines in between are just the um, migration tracks. And you can see um, the very long lines indicate very fast flight speeds every two to three minutes, um, whereas they get around the nest sites and foraging areas, the um, sort of angles are much tighter and the birds are spending more time there. So coming back to the moth trapping, so we've used quite some um, short range attraction moth traps, these heath traps. So they attract moths from about 30 meters or so. We don't want to attract moths from sort of kilometers away because we're really focused on what the moth community is immediately around the nest site or the foraging site. So it's very localized. And we'll deploy a number of these traps per night throughout June and into August, the main night jar breeding period when the night jars are either laying their eggs or have chicks in the nest. And using this standardized approach, we can then sample multiple habitats per night, and then we can take into account things like weather effects, which can obviously um, influence moth numbers. So that gives us standardized moth abundance data throughout the season at the breeding sites and the foraging sites. And where we've um, deployed them as well, so we're focused on the nesting area, which is the clear fat areas up to 15 years of age. Um, we've also got the intervening areas of habitat to mature forest. Um, and then we've also got the foraging areas. So what we find is that the night jars obviously go over the top of the mature forest, even though this might have the most abundant um, moth that's a biomass within it, the night jars just don't forage within it. So we don't really need to look at that in terms of our comparison. So in terms of um, actual moth trapping, we've just focused on the nesting areas and the foraging areas where they spend pretty much all of their time. So fecal sample collection for night jar is quite um, straightforward really, these chicks here, they're they pretty much stay in the same spot on bare ground. And you can see so just below the chicks and to the right, we've got an ample supply of fecal pellets. So this makes life very easy. We can just come along to the nest at various stages during the season when we do that regular monitoring and collect maybe between sort of 10 and 20 pellets. As long as the weather's dry, we can sort of collect these items which have been on the ground for maybe a week or two weeks or more. Um, so it's only in wet weather where they deteriorate. 
So then we can sort of collect up lots of these little things that are quite weird little um, <clears throat> blobs, really like little orbs of coils of rope all sort of bound together. Um, and once they're dried, they sort of preserve very well and they hold the DNA well. And they're fine then to be frozen prior to um, preparation analysis. So the actual sort of DNA analysis process itself is fairly <clears throat> um, sort of technical. So you start off with the actual poo itself. Um, you put this into a solution then to release the DNA within it. <clears throat> then we compare the actual DNA within the samples with libraries of other likely prey items. And then using this other technique called high throughput sequencing, we can just take the whole sample <clears throat> and process it to get out all the DNA strands within that sample. Um, and then you can compare that with a digital library of these strands to match it then to the individual species where possible or the uh, family groups. And then ultimately that gives us the individual species identification. So samples at the bottom here just gives you an indication of what the samples look like. So there's at various colours, but basically the DNA is in the liquid, which is then processed. And the high throughput sequencing is quite a, a new process, really. It means that a large number of samples can be sort of processed at one time. So once the samples are prepared um, in one run, you can maybe run through about 100 samples at once. So it's very um, effective and efficient, but it isn't cheap like most of these methods. And it can effectively detect all the DNA present in these samples. Um, however, the DNA is subject to degradation. So some of the older fecal samples will degrade a little bit over time, uh, which means that the DNA is incomplete or poor quality, and we can't necessarily um, obtain all the information from it. And also with this method that we can only really get a, a presence of a prey item. So if the prey item, a particular morph occurs 10 times in a fecal sample, will only pick up the signature once to identify it to the species. So as long as we run multiple samples, we can then look at the number of occurrences per sample. So it's still much more informative than um, previous methods. So from the work we um, conducted, we managed to get 48 sets of fecal samples, which um, had good quality DNA. And these related to 29 individual nest or roost sites. So where we've got multiple samples, we can then use that. So if we have two samples per individual, we can then look at the <clears throat> proportion of, or the number of items in each sample, and we can add those together to look at the number of minimum number of individuals um, consumed. <clears throat> but so the actual method itself, it's you know, revealed over 2000 DNA sequences, but um, the vast majority of these were omitted because the data, the DNA was of poor quality or related to contamination. So things like slugs, which will crawl over the pellets or fungus, other things which will grow on the pellets as well, um, even so human skin cells. So all that has to be sort of removed. <clears throat> but that then gives us over 400 DNA sequences, which we can then um, relate to actual nightjar prey items or potential prey items. And 90% of those we can identify at the species level, which is really um, good. And the summary here of what we found then, so this is the overall proportions of items and we can see on the left hand side that moths make up the vast majority with 65% of items being related to moths and of those the noctuid moths which is a medium to a large size moth and geometrids make up the vast bulk of the moth selection. The other interesting aspects is the dipton flies things like hover flies, crane flies and the like these make up 22% or 21% of the actual uh, diet which is much higher than discovered in previous studies, basically because they can't identify the um, individual components. But beetles only made up around 10%, which is lower than in previous studies. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, beetles are also in decline as well, which might be related. But we have picked up a number of other sort of, you know, items, ants, caddisflies, and mayflies, which will be incidentally sort of captured potentially or even targeted. So this is where it gets more technical now. So <clears throat> based on the DNA samples themselves, <clears throat> what we've done is broken down the um, diet items from the DNA. This is just focused on the moths. <clears throat> so we're looking at different um, size um, <clears throat> categories, so some 1 to 10. And at the bottom here, you can see they relate to size. One is like a, a wing length of less than 10 millimetres up to the category 10, which is a wing length greater than 25. So we're looking at the size of the moths, and then also the moth families to which they belong to. And there's a key take home message from this is that um, the moths <clears throat> in the diet are 
sort of medium size, so from sort of category four to seven. So these are about sort of 14 to 20 um, millimeters long. And the dark green indicates that the noctuid moths are the most sort of frequent in both these sites and in the diet itself, as well as the other species. <clears throat> Then coming on to the comparison then between the actual nesting sites and the foraging sites. So again, we've got a similar type of plot. So we're looking here at the moths in the various size categories. <clears throat> and looking at nesting habitat first. So the um, site in Belgium, Bosland, <clears throat> we find that um, the Arctidae, which are the so tiger moth type family, make up the vast majority of the moths there, but then it's the noctuids, the dark greens, which are more frequent. And then in Thetford, we've got a similar pattern, but the noctuids are certainly the most um, abundant there, but we have other things which are, we've sort of grouped together as the micro moths, which are the gray column on the far left. So these are very small items, but there are lots of them. Um, and these make up a, a, a good proportion of the moths actually present in the site. And these weren't actually recorded in the Belgium site. So then we want to compare that then to the moths in the foraging area. So our expectation is that um, as they go to these foraging areas, there must be something different about those foraging areas to make them go all the way, you know, two or three kilometers across the forest to forage. <clears throat> and what we find there is that generally the moth communities are pretty much a mirror image of what we find in the breeding sites, but we are finding a greater proportion of noctuid moths more obvious in the Belgium sites actually, especially when there's categories of, of size of three to five, uh, but similarly so in Thetford Forest as well. <clears throat> so just to sort of, um, sort of confirm that really, that um, at the nesting site, there are generally fewer noctuid moths and in the feeding sites, there are more noctuids. So <clears throat> that is our biggest indicator of why the birds go to where they are. So it's more sort of technical sort of, um, plots here, I'm afraid. So again, we're looking at their preference um, in terms of we know what moths are available in the background nesting and breeding habitat. And we're looking at the frequency of how much they occur in the diet compared to what's available. So if something's very abundant, we'd expect that to occur in the diet more often than something which is rarer. So what we find here, so the... Um, Red dots indicate the prey items in terms of size, the moth size, so the categories one to five. It seems that these are avoided. So the smaller moths tend to be avoided. So they're not selected as much in the diet. Whereas the larger moths are the ones which are found more in the diet. So there might be fewer of these moths, but more of them are taken by night jars. So they're actively selecting these larger moths in the diet. And the triangles in the middle means that we don't have a relationship. There's no sort of preference for their size category. Taking that forward then, um, so that sort of confirms that small moths are avoided and the medium to large moths are selected. And that's probably because it's easier to catch a few big moths, which gives you a, a big um, energy gain for limited hunting, whereas small moths would take you much longer to sort of collect enough to get the same amount of energy. Taking that forward then to the actual um, families themselves, this is a bit more technical, so it's the same as the previous one, we've got the size category up the side, but we've also got all the individual families here noted as well. And again, what we can look at then is the um, what's avoided, so again we find that within all the families there's strong avoidance for the smaller individuals, but also what's coming out is the Arctidae, which are the tiger moths, so these moths are very abundant in the breeding sites and the feeding sites, but they are actively avoided. Um, whereas for the most other species, which are sort of larger, um, again, the noctuous feature very heavily, um, these are the ones which are selected. So with the tiger moth, it's interesting why they aren't actually caught because the night jar hunting in a dusky light isn't going to distinguish between those which are sort of palatable and unpalatable. If they did, um, consume them, we would find that in their DNA, which we don't. So they must have another mechanism for avoiding them. So potentially they can maybe hear the sound that the wing beats make, which some bats can do to avoid them. Um, but that's an area of further research. But from this, the main take home message is that the noctuid moths and the geometric moths form the vast majority of the moths they're selected. And these tend to be the medium to larger size individuals. So coming back then to sort of the overall conclusions, 
So moths make up 65% of the diet based on the DNA. So this isn't um, exhaustively um, number of items. This is just the frequency of moths in the samples. Um, so that confirms the studies that moths are the main prey item. And then interesting that beetles were fewer than other studies have found, um, but more dips from flies. So obviously other flies are around in the environment and these could make up a quite important part of the diet. So the small moths are certainly avoided. So again, it's a, a, an energetic constraint that if you're going to be on a limited feeding trip, you want to get as much energy into you as quickly as possible and get back to your chicks. Or if you've been roosting all day to feed up as quickly as possible and get back to your territory. But so the noctuids are the main, and um, geometrids are the main family selected. Um, so say so the avoidance of these tiger moths, that's quite interesting. So they're avoiding the small ones and these ones which are sort of unpalatable. Um, so that's just something you wouldn't necessarily expect from the abundance of moths on the site. And it's interesting that the feeding site and the moth communities um, are quite well established. So these are long-term sort of grassland areas. So moths will be there, they'll be laying their eggs, they'll be surviving much more regularly than they do in the actual um, clear fat areas in the forest. So there's an ample supply of a good variety of moths and a good variety of noctuids, um, which makes them easier to um, detect. And also on a hunting aspect, the open nature of the uh, foraging habitats means that they haven't got any obstacles or they haven't got any shading from the surrounding trees. So this makes the moss much easier to spot from below when they're looking up against the sort of semi sort of dusky sky, as night jars are pretty much all um, hunting by eyesight. So this probably makes it even easier for them to actually spot their prey and catch their prey rather than being in an enclosed environment. So coming back to the sort of declines themselves really, so nightjar being a very much a moth specialist, um, the ongoing decline in large moth numbers is quite concerning, especially given that it's over 38% in the last 50 years in southern Britain. Um, so we can't say at this stage whether that is impacting the population of Thetford Forest, we think it might be a contributing factor. Um, but if the moth decline isn't affecting night jars already, then it is certainly likely to affect them at some point in the near future. Also, the declines in uh, beetles and different flies and other insects have also like to affect night jars. We know that from previous study in Thetford Forest that beetles um, comprise up to about 20% of items in pellets. And it's certainly likely that um, the beetles have declined locally as they are nationally. And also a change from um, grazed heathlands to non-grazed heathlands means there's less dung, less dung beetles, so less options to feed upon. Um, just to really say this is very much initial work, we've got quite small sample sizes, so we do need to increase the number of samples to get a better representation of the full range of prey items the birds are consuming. So we have collected other samples across other sites in Britain as well. And there are other diet studies which have looked at a couple of sites. So we are looking to combine these to get a much better understanding of the prey they select um, and their preference and how this might be impacted by the moth declines. As there might be certain species of moth which are declining more rapidly, which the nightjar prefer, which then could drive the decline even further. So I'll end by there so by saying thank you very much for listening. And just to show you some of the moths that they are selecting, there's a, a range of things here. These are sort of typical noctuid moths, which they are selecting. So it's sort of quite gray, not the most obvious and interesting species, but the ones they do avoid, the more brightly colored tiger moths um, are very abundant on their sites, but they just aren't consumed. So I'll leave it there and say, thank you very much for your time and take any questions. Thank you very much, Greg. Really great to see that. Um, we have time for a few questions and then any that aren't answered, I'll get Greg to answer in the chat. Um, so starting off, we have a question about, do the male and female of a nesting pair use the same foraging area? Um, we have tried to follow that. So we have tagged birds at the same nest and in most cases they will use similar foraging areas. Um, but generally we don't try to tag both the pair just to limit the disturbance. Um, but from looking at the wider sort of picture, the birds from certain nest territories do have distinct foraging territories, which are quite sort of similar in habitat, but they seem to be quite distinct. Um, so in some cases, the pair will go to a, a very similar area at least. Oh, thank you. 
Um, one of the other questions asked whether, regarding the drop of 34% in Thetford Forest, have you found a certain moth is declining more than others? At this stage, it's quite early, too early to tell really. Our sample sizes from Thetford Forest are quite small, um, so we haven't really got a, a good representation. So the further work, we've got more samples collected, which are awaiting analysis, and that will really further confirm um, which the key species is declining. But from the initial analysis, we did find that of the moth species that are selected by Nightjar, around a third to a half of those species were some of the species which are in the steepest decline. So that does raise concerns that they may well be sort of impacted more. Cool. Um, one person asked sort of about the tiger moths that are being avoided. Do they contain toxic substances at all? Yes, generally the tiger moths are very unpalatable palatable to birds, so the brightly colour so tends to ward off any sort of passerine species. Um, but obviously night jars at night can't sort of di differentiate the colours or the patterns, so it's really quite interesting how they can actually avoid them, given that they are sort of some of the most abundant moths on the side. Cool. Um, we have a question from Facebook as well, from uh, Jane, who's been watching. It says, what sort of beetles do the night jars eat? Um, again, quite a range of beetles, but some of the dung beetles do sort of feature in the diet. So in the previous study, they were quite a major um, component. So we know night jars associate with livestock on their so heathen sites, yeah, hence the name goat sucker. Um, so there is an association with insects attracted to animals and also um, beetles associated with the dung. But again, with a bigger sample, hopefully they'll be able to um, refine that answer. Cool, thank you. Um, I'll ask one final question because there's loads more coming in, but sadly we'll have to move to our last talk. Um, I've got a question saying, you don't seem to be sampling in May when the birds arrive and need to get into breeding condition. Is there a reason for that? Um, there's a very good reason for that. So when the birds first arrive in May, um, they're obviously in their roosting areas. These tend to be roosting up high, quite high in trees. So to actually find the roost sites and obtain the um, pellets is very difficult. It's only when they come down to their nesting sites that they're able to collect sufficient pellets. I mean, the Belgian study has um, recovered a number of roosting pellets. So we have a bit of information there. Um, but generally, the moth numbers are quite low in May. So again, the moth trapping is less successful. But again, that's something we might be able to look into in future. But it, it's very time consuming and requires a lot of effort. Cool. Thank you very much. So sadly, there have been loads more questions come in for you, Greg. So if you wouldn't mind answering them on the Zoom, uh, sort of just directly, that would be great in the chat. But otherwise, we're going to have to move on to our third and final speaker. But this is from Mark Wilson um, from our Scottish office. So thank you very much, Greg. And we will move on to Mark, who is talking about tracking of migratory passerines breeding in Scotland using miniaturised geolocator. So thank you very much, Mark. Off you go. Thanks. Right. Hopefully that's working now. Um, yeah, so as Catherine said, I'm going to be talking to you today about an ongoing bit of work that's looking at migratory behaviour of six species of songbirds that breed in Britain, all of which are declining in at least part of their range here. And because this work is ongoing, I don't have any very detailed results or conclusions like the two previous talks. But what I will say a bit about is why we're particularly interested in these species and some of the, the questions that we want to have a go at answering. And I'll go on to describe the miniaturized tags that we used, how we caught the birds, and then finish by telling you how we got on this year and uh, what lies in store next year. So this graph is taken from Nancy Ockenden's excellent 2012 paper on patterns in migrant bird population trends. And it shows that our migrants span a range of different trends from disastrously negative at the turtle dove end of the spectrum to very positive up with chiff chaffs and black caps. And the work I'm presenting today focuses on six species which are camped uh, mostly at the declining end of the spectrum. So generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that understanding migration ecology generally can help us to evaluate and address population declines and to hone in on the most important factors. But this project is aiming to delve a bit deeper into how migration might vary between different populations of these species 
than we've been able to in the past. Fieldwork over the past few years has focused on populations in England, and the work that I'm going to be talking about that we carried out this year aims to generate comparable data on these species for Scottish populations. The next few slides illustrate why we think such comparisons might be helpful. So I'm going to go through each of the six species that we're focusing on to see how their recent population trends compare between different parts of Britain. And on each of these slides, there's maps from the Atlas and there's trend graphs, which are derived from BBS data. And for these two species, uh, wind chat and wood warbler, there's no Scottish trends available from BBS due to their being encountered too infrequently on BBS surveys. But you can see from the Atlas maps, so looking at the, the relative abundance map, which is on the right, that both species have good concentrations of their population in Scotland and are more abundant in Scotland than across most of England. Looking at the abundance change maps, which are on the left, these are dominated across their full range by areas of decline in blue. So that's the same in Scotland as elsewhere, indicating that the large declines shown by the BBS graphs apply more or less evenly across their whole British range. For Garden warbler and spotted flycatcher, um, as with the previous two species, they're detected too infrequently on BBS surveys to cal calculate a separate breeding population trend for Scotland. But the Atlas maps suggest that population trends for both species is more positive in Scotland than in England. For spotted flycatcher, the picture in Scotland is mixed with decreases in much of the, the south and east, counterbalanced by increases in parts of the north and west. Garden warbler is still scarce in most parts of Scotland north of the central belt, but it's increased markedly in much of south and central Scotland. And for both species, the pattern in Scotland contrasts starkly with the pattern in England, particularly in the southeast, which is um, universal decline. For the last two species, enough willow warblers and tree pipits are detected on BBS surveys to produce separate trends for both Scotland and England. And as you can see from those trends on the right hand side of the slide, and also from the, the Atlas abundance change maps, willow warbler and tree pipits are, are doing much better in Scotland than in most parts of England. This figure is the same as the one that I showed earlier uh, from Nancy Ockenden's paper, but it's recolored to show the main climatic zone that each of these migrant species winters in. Many of the species with populations that have declined in recent decades spend their winters in the humid zone of sub-Saharan Africa. So that's areas where annual rainfall tends to average more than one meter. All six of the species that we're focusing on, which are, these are the ones that are outlined in red and they've got red arrows pointing at them as well. They're all humid zone migrants. And understanding whether populations from different parts of Britain vary in their migration behavior could help us to understand why they're declining more in some regions than in others. To maybe illustrate why that information might be helpful while looking at migration behavior could help us to understand differences and declines. We'll look at information from another humid zone migrant, the cuckoo, whose migration ecology is arguably better understood than that of most of our other migrant species, thanks to the hugely successful um, study efforts of Chris Hewson, uh, Phil Atkinson, and some of my other BTO colleagues down in Thetford. The findings on this slide are taken from a 2016 paper by Chris, which looked at the migration routes taken by cuckoos breeding in different parts of Britain. The map of Britain on the left is based on bird atlas data like the other maps we were looking at. And as you can see, the pattern for cuckoo is similar to that of tree pipits and wood warblers with decreases in the south and east, contrasting with increases in the north and west. These pie charts around here in red and yellow 
show what proportion of birds tagged in different parts of Britain took the eastern red or the western yellow flyways, which are illustrated in this uh, large map on the right on their autumn migrations to Africa. And you can see that a large proportion of birds from the areas where cuckoos are decreasing take the western route, whereas pretty much all the birds from the areas where cuckoo trends are more positive took the eastern route. It may be that patterns like this indicate that differences in migration routes are at least partly responsible for breeding population differences between um, different areas and breeding population trends in Britain. But alternatively, the pattern could have arisen because birds in poorer condition from parts of Britain where conditions for cuckoos have deteriorated um, are forced to make suboptimal decisions about their migration and the routes that they take. But whatever the connection here, this kind of pattern can get us closer to understanding the reasons for population decline and move us closer to a position where we can perhaps do something about them. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the tags that we used. We weren't able to use the, the tags that were used by Chris and others to study cuckoos because they'd be way too big to study the species that we were working on. We used far smaller tags called geolocators, which are quite simple in principle, but still very clever. So just by recording light levels every few minutes, the geolocators collect data that can be used to work out the tag's position on Earth each day. Basically, day length, which is derived from the light level recordings is used to work out latitude. So that's where, where the tag is on a north-south axis. While the timing of solar midday, that's roughly equivalent to time zone, you can think of it as, is used to work out longitude where they are east to west. Positions collected and worked out from geolocator data aren't very precise, um, much less precise than GPS tags which can get you down to kind of meter levels of precision. Geolocator tags, we're talking more about hundreds of kilometers of precision, which would be useless for looking at short scale movements. So for instance, looking at habitat use on breeding grounds, but it's actually fine for looking at um, collecting information that can be used to look at migration, timing, routes and destinations. Those kind of things uh, pan out over thousands of kilometers so 100 kilometers here or there isn't too important. The tags were attached to birds via simple leg loop harnesses, which are made of a slightly elasticated material. And you can see that in the photo there. And the total weight of the tag and the harness was within 4% of the body weight of the smaller species, that's wood and willow warblers, and well under 3% for the other species. The battery life varies a bit from unit to unit, but it should be enough to allow devices to capture autumn and spring migrations, as well as any large movements made over the winter. And one other important aspect of these tags is that they are archival, which means that all of the information they collect is stored on the tag itself. And that in order to get that information back, we're going to have to cap capture the birds again. Most of our field work was carried out in May and June of this year, and it was largely restricted to central Scotland, focusing particularly on sites in the hill ranges of the Trossachs and the Ockels, but opportunistically taking in other sites as these became available to us. And for most species, we targeted singing males, luring them into mist nets, which are pictured on this slide here, using playback of their song. And that worked really well for most species but not for spotted flycatchers. So we had to use a different approach for these and guided by the experience of our colleagues who had tagged spotted flycatchers over the past couple of years in England. We took advantage of their habit of returning to particular perches. Um, and we did also use mist nets when the opportunity arose, but mostly we caught these birds in traps that are called perch traps. And for those of you that aren't familiar with these, I will explain how these work in a little bit. Um, spotted flycatchers did occur in good numbers in some of our main woodland study sites, for instance, in the Trossachs. But in those areas, 
they tend to spend a lot of their time high in the canopy where they would be very hard to catch with perch traps or via any other technique. So we focused on birds nesting in relatively open areas, mostly gardens, which we found by putting out a call for information to the wider public. And we did this through Tay Ringing Group, through BTO Scotland's supporter e-newsletter, and also um, the BTO's Garden Bird Watch team um, helped us as well. So considering the restricted geographical area that we were interested in, and also the short turnaround of our request, we got a really good response from lots of people that were not only willing to tell us where they had seen spotted flycatchers, but were happy to host catching attempts in their gardens. And we owe a big thank you to all of these volunteers, some of whom went well above and beyond the call of duty. So they took us around different nests, they helped us with catching, they brought us tea and refreshments, um, and a, a few spotted flycatcher hosts took the hosting quite literally and offered us places to stay for the night. One lady, the lady pictured in the top right here, whose garden we trapped at, wrote a short piece about the project for the regional newspaper, which is the Argyle Advertiser, I think, which is known locally as the Squeak. So many thanks to all of these people, and we're going to be seeing a lot of them again next year when we try to recatch these birds. Right, so as I said, I'm going to briefly explain to you how perch traps work. Apologies for um, to those of you that are already familiar with how these traps work, or to those of you that aren't interested in trap design, but I was really taken with these. And um, it's a design that could be used effectively to catch birds in a lot of circumstances where they might be difficult to catch otherwise, particularly, as you might expect, perching birds. So the basic structure, as illustrated here, is of two light metal frames, which are use loosely fitted with one and a half centimeter mesh, which is a uh, misnet netting. And these are joined together along one side to a hinged central bar. And that hinge is sprung so that, as shown in the left hand picture here, the two panels want to close together above the bar in the direction shown by the blue arrows. But they're held downwards in a closed position by a loop of thread which is attached to the central bar and brought around tightly, holding the two panels closed against the force of the spring, as shown here, so that the last big, the last bit of the loop comes back to the bar on the other side. And this is a close up of the central bar showing how that loop that's holding the panels together is held in place. So there's a short metal seesaw kind of a thing, which is attached to the bar with a short pin at one end that holds that loop in place. And to the other end of the seesaw is attached a twig that you have to select um, to look as far as you can tell, like a temptingly attractive perch. And once we'd set the perch trap um, up, we usually put it on the end of a pole in a position close to and preferably slightly above a perch that the bird that we were trying to catch had been seen to use. And if the bird agrees with your assessment of the new perch's attractiveness, the idea is that it lands on it, and this moves the perch end of the seesaw down, which moves the pin up, releasing the end of the looped thread and allowing the trap to close. And the bird is then extracted from the trap in much the same way as you would extract a bird from a, a normal mist net. So we positioned perch traps, um, up to four perch traps, uh, around the vicinity of nests, in the middle of bushes, on the edge of gables and gutters on roofs, um, beside chimneys, along fences, basically anywhere that we had seen flycatchers uh, returning to repeatedly while foraging or stopping at on their way to coming back to provisioning a nest. Sometimes, where we weren't having luck with this, an effective strategy was to put a trap up near the nest, sometimes in conjunction with a mist net as shown here, so that the, the perch of the trap was near the nest entrance and that birds looking for a way around a mist net or simply wanting to have a look around before going into the nest would sometimes perch on a trap, even, 
even when the perch was in a position where there had been no perch before. So while, while I was very impressed with the effectiveness of these traps, and I'm sure we'd have caught far fewer spotted flycatchers without them, it often could, took quite a bit of trial and error before we were successful. This is a, a very strong contrast with the use of the mist nets and the playback that we used on the other species, where, where for most of the most of the time, provided that we got our trapping attempts right, so we were trapping at a stage in the breeding season when the birds were full of testosterone and very willing to respond territorially to any infringement on their on their patch. Um, we would usually catch birds within a minute of starting the playback. Catching spotted flycatchers required a lot more flexibility and imagination and above all patience. But at most nests that we tried to catch at, we did eventually catch and tag birds and huge thanks to our colleague Lee Barber for coming up to Scotland to initiate us in the exciting waiting game that is spotted flycatcher catching. So how did we do and what comes next? Over all of these six species, we managed to tag 85 birds in Scotland this year, which will hopefully give us a good enough sample size to be comparing with information from birds tagged in England. However, as I've said, first we're going to have to catch them again. Unlike most tags deployed on larger birds these days, geolocators don't send us any of the information that they're collecting automatically. They store it all on board so that in order to see where these birds went during the winter, we're going to have to get the tags back and download the data from them. Not all of these tagged birds are going to return, and of those that do, we probably won't manage to catch all of them. But if we retrieve even a quarter of the tags that we put out this year, that would still put us in a much better position to understand whether migration routes or destinations could be contributing to some of the variation that we see in population changes of migrant birds across the UK. Even if we find no difference between the migration timing, routes or destinations of English and Scottish birds, that's still going to be a really useful finding as it's going to steer our attention firmly towards looking to the breeding grounds for the factors that contribute to the differences in population change between different parts of Britain. So that could be habitat or food availability or, or climate change even. Thanks are owed to a lot of people for the work that I've just talked about. These include the funders, um, the project organizer, Chris Hewson, a small army of BTO staff, many of whom gave up a lot of their free time to help with the project. Volunteers um, from a, a wide suite of different people in the BTO's audience helped with almost every aspect of the project from providing information and logistical support through to catching and tagging. BTO staff also really helped with making that volunteer participation possible. And there were a range of organizations and individuals that gave us access to land for field work. Thanks and apologies to anybody that I've omitted to mention here. And thanks to all of you for listening. Thank you very much, Mark. That was really good. It's amazing to see what's going on with that. Um, you've got a number of questions, so um, I'm going to jump right into them if you're ready. Um, yep. The first one from Aileen asks, what's the cost of the tags? Uh, these tags, I think I, ha I haven't been the one that purchased them, but I think these tags cost in the range of um, about £100, th there or thereabouts, maybe a little bit more. So they're quite cheap in relation to say a lot of GPS tags. Um, but yeah, the, the downside is that we're gonna have to go again next year to get the tags back. No worries, thank you. Um, Kanishka asks, is there any risk to the birds from the perch trap? I being um, struck by the bars at all? Yeah, it's a good question. That, and I was wondering the same thing myself when I first saw the, the traps, but one of the reasons that I, I like them so much is that I don't think there is much or any risk at all because the trap closes really quickly. And at the point where the bird triggers the trap, it's, it's usually landing on the perch 
And so its momentum is going downwards and the trap springs closed really quickly and it they don't really have time. Even something like a spotted flycatcher that has lightning quick reflexes, um, they don't have time to get away or to fly to a, a kind of a location of the trap where they'd put themselves at risk. Oh, thank you. That's good to know. Um, we have a question from Facebook. Uh, John asks, do you ever think spotted flycatchers could ever return to a failed nest site? And he says, we lost a pair after heavy rain and I want to support a tag geolocation scheme in northwest Cambridgeshire. I don't know is the short answer. Um, I've worked more on spotted flycatchers this summer than I have ever before in my life, so I learned a lot. I think um, the best thing to do would be to get in touch with colleagues of mine who have worked on spotted flycatchers over several years and the name that is springing to my mind is Lee Barber. Again, he knows a huge amount about nesting birds in general, having been closely involved with the, the nest record scheme and ringing schemes. And yeah, he, he would almost certainly know the answer to that. Brilliant. Well, uh, he's available to be contacted via our website. If you search for him, he'll be part of the rigging teams there. Um, we've got another question from Tim saying, are there opportunities to volunteer to assist these studies for someone with limited or no previous experience? You've got an offer of help. <laughs> Definitely. And lots of the people who volunteered um, spotted flycatchers to us and got involved in some ways were, uh, they weren't kind of professionals or even experienced amateurs they they were they just knew enough to identify spotted flycatchers that's a a bit of a prerequisite to to put birds forward for something like this but then uh, absolutely we were really helped by lots of people that had very little previous experience cool um before i ask the final question i've got just one of my own um is there anything different you do next year uh, how, how it's gone this time yeah, well, hopefully that there was some um, a, a little bit of delay in getting the tags this year, and because next year we, we largely are going to be focusing on retrieving tags rather than deploying them, so we can get started as soon as birds come back. And so I would be hoping that we're going to start in April when birds are kind of at the at the peak of their territoriality, and that will hopefully make it. Um, even easier to get the tags back off a lot of them. Fantastic. Um, there's uh, ooh, there's an extra question come in. I, I'm, I'm leaving Hillary's question for last. Um, people will understand why. Uh, Chris Payne asks, if ringers are lucky enough to catch geotagged birds, what's the advice you give? Can they remove them at all? Yes, absolutely. Please don't let the birds go with the geolocator on them for the bird's sake and for our sake. So. Um, the best thing to do, rather than just assuming that the tags will belong to us, the best thing to do will be to contact the ringing scheme. Having taken that tag off in the spring, I've just, I've just thought the reason that I'm speaking more slowly now is because I've just thought if you're, if you're fairly certain that this isn't a tag that will have just been put on by somebody. So if the birds are coming back in the spring, I think it's unlikely that these are going to be just freshly put on. If they're geolocators that look like the one that I showed in my talk, I think you can take them off in the spring and get in touch with the ringing unit and see what the history of the ringed bird was. And that'll tell you who to get in touch with to get the tag back. Thank you very much, Mark. So the final question is, where is the magnificent Highland cow? <laughs> ah, um, yeah, that was at one of our uh, catching sites. Um, spotted flycatchers have very good taste, it turns out, in the, the gardens that they choose to nest in. They're, they're usually nice, big, well-appointed gardens. And um, the, the, there's a trap just in front of it because we'd seen the bird using that, uh, perching on the horns of that highland cow and... Uh, yeah, of course, when, once we put the perch there, it, it didn't even look at it, but um, that was our idea. Fantastic. Um, sadly, we've come to the end of the question sections and I'll have to close this talk, but uh, Richard Defoe has actually put a suggestion of putting a list of ring numbers on the ringers section to help people know which ones to take off and which ones not to, which sounds like a good idea. No, that so sounds I'll, I'll let you answer Thanks, back Richard. to that one. Yeah. 
So thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm sure you've all enjoyed this session. It's a fantastic three talks. Um, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for their fascinating contributions and all of you for giving up your time to participate in our uh, virtual conference session. As I mentioned at the start, now more than ever, our research relies on your support and there are many ways to support us. Many of you are already doing many great things for us, but right now the best way to help is actually by donating to our vital work. You can donate to where the, great, the need is greatest by following the link on the screen. Um, but I, having said all that, I'd like to thank you again and hope you can join us for more of our talks. And the next session is actually tomorrow, um, 3rd of December. Uh, Professor Claire Spottiswade is going to be giving our Witherby lecture at 7 p.m. And you can find out details on our website. But until then, or until the next time, thank you very much again and have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>